All right, so we're going to get started on Revelation. So if you want to open up to Revelation chapter 1. So first of all, what do you know about Revelation? That last book of the Bible. Anyone know why it's the last book of the Bible? It talks about end times. Yeah. Yeah. It describes the last day and most likely it's the last book written for the Bible. Who is the author of Revelation? John. John. Although that was a trick question. It's really Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. In that whenever I announce it, we have a reading from the book of Revelation that uh, say it's Jesus Christ's revelation to St. John. So it's really John writing down what, uh, John, what Jesus gives him. So the apostle John is the inspired writer of Revelation. Uh, the date of the writing is probably around 95 AD. And John writes it while he was a prisoner on the island of Patmos. Uh, which is on the western coast of present-day Turkey. I'll show you a picture later on of the island of Patmos as well as the cave John was in when he wrote this. Uh, it is near the city of Ephesus. So John had been in exile by the Roman emperor Domitian, who was a persecutor of the church. Uh, John is most likely the only one of the 12 apostles who was uh, not martyred for his faith. The other 11 were all put to death in different ways. John is the only one who died a normal, what we would say, a normal death. Now, when you read Revelation, are you intimidated by it? Yes. yes. Why? It is hard to understand. Uh, I'm going to be recording podcasts later today on uh, chapters 16 through 19 with Pastor Lightman for our Thirsty podcast. And, and I'm reading it and I've read it multiple times and studied it and taught on it. And I'm going, what does this mean? Okay. Uh, but Revelation is a valuable book. It is a beautiful book. It's a comforting book. It's a challenging book, but it's also an easy book. Why do you think I would say it's an easy book? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's the same thing over and over and over and one more time over again. It's the basic statement of Revelation is we win. And, and that's it, that Jesus wins and the saints win. And it's, it's really like, uh, you know, football season, you know, NFL season, college football season has started. And if you're a football fan and there's a great play, you watch it. And then you may be watching slow motion and then you watch it in real time. Then you watch it from different camera angles. That's the way you can picture the book of revelation is we're going to look at uh, judgment day from earth's point of view. We're going to look at judgment day from heaven's point of view. We're going to look at judgment day from what it means for the saints and what I'm studying right now in the later chapters of revelation, uh, what judgment day means for the unbelievers okay and really it's also easy in that if you know the rest of scripture so that's the difficulty for us we don't know scripture as well as we should but what i'll do as we go through this i'll point out the different imagery and that's kind of what revelation is it's kind of like a picture book both words okay so it's a uh i started reading to the uh, ECC students here uh, every Thursday and go to each of the classrooms and just reading picture books and holding the book up, reading the words. Well, you just have to understand the, the pictures that go along with the words to understand it. All right. Let's go get into Revelation chapter one. So if you've got it open, I'll read it. The revelation from Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. 
Christ expressed this revelation by means of symbols sent through his angel to his servant, John. John spoke as a witness to the word of God and to the testimony about Jesus Christ, that is, to everything he saw. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and hold on to the things written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is coming, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood, and made us a kingdom and priest to God his Father, to him be the glory and the power forever. Amen. Look, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him, and all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingship of patient endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. I was in spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write what you see on a scroll and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like a son of man. He was clothed with a robe that reached to his feet, and around his chest he wore a gold sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool or like snow. His eyes were like blazing flames. His feet were like polished bronze being refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. He held seven stars in his right hand. A sharp two-edged sword was coming out of his mouth. His face was shining as the sun shines in all its brightness. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead and see, I am alive forever and ever. And I also hold the keys of death and hell. So write what you have seen, both those things that are and those that will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. All right, so Revelation, we need to understand it's real history, but it's not a history book that uh, each succeeding chapter is chronological sequence. That's what uh, gets other Christians and other Christian church bodies in trouble as they read it as a chronological book. It's not. It's like was Jan mentioned before. It's one history, and then we look at it in a different angle of that history and so forth. Uh, and what is it the history of? We said Judgment Day, but it's what point to Judgment Day? It's a weird way to phrase that question. It's from the New Testament era. So the, from Jesus ascending into heaven until Jesus descending in the clouds. So uh, like we're going to look at the the time frame it's described in different ways, like three and a half years, 1200, 1240 days and so forth. Uh, it, that's all a description of the New Testament era. All right. So the key to understanding revelation then is recognizing what reality is being described in the symbols of these visions. Uh, so here's one of the notes from the EHV on a principle for following this message. Revelation does not tell one continuous story. It describes the history between Jesus' ascension and his second coming several different times from several different angles. This is a huge help for readers in understanding the message. If something is unclear to you at first, just keep reading. Again, it likens it like I did before. Reading Revelation is like watching a football game on TV. You can watch we keep watching the replays of the same scene over and over until you figure out what happened. Reading Revelation is like filling in a crossword puzzle by using the letters on one line of the puzzle to figure out the rest of the puzzle. Use the literal descriptions in the rest of the New Testament to understand the symbols. 
the reference and the notes will help you do this. And so what it's saying there is, uh, well, as Lutherans, what is one way that we interpret scripture? We use the clear passages to interpret the unclear or difficult passages. Uh, so when we read Revelation, we really need to just picture Matthew 25. So go ahead, or 24, go to, go to Matthew chapter 24. We'll come back right away to Revelation. Okay, so I'll read Matthew 24. So that's on page 1468 in the EHV. And as Jesus talks about the end times, from his ascension into heaven to his descending in the clouds. As Jesus left the temple and was walking away, his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the temple buildings. Then he replied to them, do you see all of these things? Amen, I tell you, no one stone here will be left on another that will not be thrown down. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Jesus answered them, watch out that no one deceives you because many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed because all these things must happen, but that is not the end. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, but all these things are only the beginning of birth pains. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted and they will put you to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away from faith. They will betray each other and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because lawlessness will, will increase. The law of many will grow cold, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination that causes desolation that was spoken of through the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then those who are in Judea should flee to the mountains. The one of, on the housetop should not go down to take anything out of his house. The one who is in the field should not return to get his clothes. How terrible it will be for those who are pregnant or are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on a Sabbath. For at that time, there will be a great distress, unlike any that has happened since the beginning of the world until now, and unlike any that will happen again. If those days were not shortened, nobody would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, these days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone tells you, look, here is a Christ or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive even the elect, if it were possible. See, I have told you in advance, so I tell you, look, there he is in the wilderness, do not go out there. Or look, there he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Just as lightning flashes from the east and shines as far as the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Wherever the carcass may be, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the misery of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and at that time all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Okay, so what are the signs of the end times, the signs of Jesus' return? What are some things that you, you're going to see? Earthquakes and famines. What else? Pre pre people pretending to be Jesus or be false Christ, or we might call them antichrists. What else? Countries fighting with each other. Yeah, wars, rumors of wars. Uh, also, the gospel being spread to all the nations. So then, the question is: Are <clears throat> are those things happening right now? Yeah. Yeah. 
Are, are we having famines? Yeah. Are, do we have like uh, hurricanes battering our nation? Yeah. Are there wars and rumors of wars? Yeah, just look at Afghanistan and pretty much any other nation in the world. Uh, is the gospel being spread in all the world? Yeah. And even this last year when so much was shut down, you know, then churches found out new ways to share the gospel, you know, electronically and so forth. Uh, and so what it's saying is Jesus could come in any moment. Jesus could have come right away. The Thessalonians, they thought that they saw all of these signs and that's why they thought Jesus was coming and they stopped working though. And Paul, that's why Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, keep working, but Jesus can come at any time. We don't know when, but these are reminders of us. But the idea is with Revelation that when you understand Matthew 24, we're going to see wars and rumors of wars. We're going to, uh, in Revelation, we're going to see the persecution of the saints. We're going to see Jesus sending his angels to come down the clouds. Okay, all of that, Matthew 24, but it's just a reminder as Jesus gives this vision of 22 chapters to St. John to Christians who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Larry. I think one of the confusing things is in the first part of that passage, it says, you will be hated by all nations. And it sounds like he's talking directly to the apostles, but he's really not. He's talking to everybody. Yeah. As for, it sounds for, like he's talking to the apostles as he's addressing them. And you're thinking, well, what are they thinking? You know, um, when he's talking with them. Um, yeah, but it's going to be, you're right. It's It applies to us as Christians are the ones who are going to be hated. Transcending time when he's talking to them. Right. Just like uh, for this Sunday, as I'm preparing the sermon on unity, Jesus prays for unity for his disciples in that room, but he's really praying for his disciples of all time. Well, when we discussed this earlier, when we were talking about Matthew, he said this could be like two parts. Uh, the first part was the destruction of Jerusalem. Correct. And he mentioned that. And then the second part was the second coming. Right. And it'll be fine. Yep. The same page. And Yep. It makes it a little yep, exactly. <clears throat> All right, so going back into Revelation, but I just want to give you that background. We because we're like we're not gonna take all the time to read Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah or the plagues of Egypt, but all of those things play heavily into Revelation. All right, so just we're gonna go kind of verse by verse walking through this. And then feel free to ask questions, and I'll ask questions of you as well. Uh, all right, so verse one. This is revelation. So the Greek word for revelation is apocalypse. Uh, and it is uh, an apocalypse that's coming. But notice, what is... John writing about, are these things that might happen or could happen? Look at verse one. Yeah, must happen. This is God's set plan. Nothing's going to be prevented from being completed. So that's the imagery of Revelation. If you understand, as you hear about all of the really scary things that are gonna be happening to us as Christians, in picture language and revelation in what Jesus just told us in Matthew, we still don't need to be afraid because these things will happen. Jesus will win. Uh, verse three, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and are blessed by those, blessed are those who hear it and hold on to these things. Why should we be eager to read this book? Yeah, that's the comfort that Jesus wins. Uh, we are promised blessing. We know that everything that's written in this book will be fulfilled. Uh, it's kind of like if I play a game with my, my girls. You know, Shelly says I have to win everything I play. Uh, I tell her I don't have to win everything. I just I don't want to lose. 
<laughs> okay. Now the difference is in my mind. So if I play, I played bags a couple of weeks ago with someone and I lost uh, five games in a row. And that, that burned me because I'm, I'm supposed to be good at bags at uh, cornhole. And yet I wasn't upset because I played well. It was my partner's fault. They lost. Uh, that, uh, but the key is if I'm playing a game with my girls or someone else and I know I can always do better. I know maybe I'm just holding back some dad. I want him to get better. And, and that's the thing with this. It, it, it might really stink right now for us as Christians as it has throughout the history of the world. And yet, ultimately, we win. All right, so how do we know that John is the author of this, of this letter? It's a pretty obvious answer. He says it right there, right? John, verse 4. And to whom is he writing? Yeah, to the seven churches. So I have that on the screen. Uh, and you kind of look at it. Uh, so he's on the island of Patmos writing this. And then the letter is first going to Ephesus, which is really near the island of Patmos. And then you can kind of see in going in a, a clockwise fashion of uh, delivering these letters to the churches. Uh, and if you go through chapters two and three, you can just see the headings. You go, the letter is first to Ephesus, and then there's a letter to Smyrna, and then to Pergamum, and then to Thyatira, and Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Right, so now, does that mean that this letter is not intended for us? No, it's intended for us too, but there are specific things that are given specifically to these seven churches. Uh, well, seven is also in Revelation a, a symbolic number. You know, there, there may have been more churches, but he picks these seven big churches, I guess. And, he, and then the seven is often a number of like Pastor Lightning said in our podcast, uh, three plus four. You know, that's math. But three is the number of the Trinity. And four is the number of everything about having to do with the earth and humanity. So three plus four equals seven. So the seven churches. Yeah. I have a little snippet in my Bible here that says um, <clears throat> the number seven a symbol of perfection in the ancient world mm -hmm. is repeated in many of John's visions. Yeah. My Bible said the seven is the completeness. Yep, number of completeness, yeah. Exactly. So, but the key is, and we're going to, uh, the next lesson that we, we do, we'll look at the, the letters to these seven churches, uh, and there's a uh, definite way that he writes uh, to the church, and then, uh, and we'll apply that to ourselves. Are these all churches that were founded by Paul? Were they all founded by Paul? I'm not sure. I don't remember. I don't think so. I mean, he visited Ephesus, but I don't, I don't know. If, I don't remember the other ones he visited. That's a good question. Uh, but it seems to be that John was very instrumental in Ephesus because I remember visiting there uh, with my wife and a number of other pastors and wives a number of years ago. And in Ephesus, they have a big church. Oh, they did. You know, everything's in ruins there. Uh, but there was a church of St. John. Uh, Turkey. Yeah. Uh, there's a church of St. John and then a little chapel for St. Mary. Which is pretty interesting why why would they have a church of saint john and a chapel of saint mary now, so it wasn't having to do with the catholics this is an old old church this would have been that first century first couple centuries well yeah exactly remember when jesus was on the cross one of the seven words that he spoke was giving Mary, 
to John as a son, and to John, here is your mother. And so the two of them are together, and you know, John has uh, people build a church to St. John to honor him, and then to honor his a kind of adopted mom, foster mom, Mary. Uh, look at that greeting in the uh, verses four and following. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is coming. Why is that important? Who is, who was, and who is to come? Yeah, eternity. He was there before the history of the world, before time began. He will be there when time ends. And from the seven spirits before his throne. So that's an imagery of the Holy Spirit. Again, everything you said about the uh, seven of holiness, completeness. And so the Holy Spirit is pictured as seven spirits. And we see later, we see in Isaiah chapter 11, the seven gifts of the spirit. What does it mean? Uh, Jesus, the Christ, you know, he is the anointed one, the faithful witness. Well, he's the source of this book. How about the firstborn from the dead? What does that title mean? Yeah, he was the first one and he was called elsewhere the first fruits and then we are the rest are, are the rest of the harvest. So, you know, I've got tomatoes and peppers and you, maybe you have those two. You get the first couple of tomatoes and peppers, they're the first fruits and then the rest are coming in and then you bring them into church and give them away because you get so many. Okay. Uh, Jesus is the firstborn, the first fruit of the dead. You and I are the rest. The ruler of the kings of the earth. What does that title mean? Yeah, he's above everyone. The king of kings and lord of lords, right? Uh, and he points, that points to the power that Jesus will display throughout the book as he's seated at the right hand of God. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood and made us a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. That phrase, who has freed us from our sins by his own blood. Why is that phrase by his own blood, talking about the Son of God, so significant? I think it's something that we as Christians may take for granted. Why should we never take for granted that the son of God has blood? Yeah, but even the fact that he has blood. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. That he's human and God. Okay, so God can't bleed. God can't suffer. God can't die. But with this title that Jesus gives to himself for John to write down, by his blood, you know, that he took on human form for us, flesh and blood to die for us. Uh, Amen, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. And all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. Uh, so Jesus was pierced not just by the Roman soldiers, but by all sinners who sent him to death by their sins. Uh, and then he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. What does that mean? Yeah. So I put those letters up on the screen. Why are those letters so significant, Alpha and Omega? Yeah, so just like the A and Z. So the other day when I went to uh, get my picture taken for, for WLS, I was like, oh, that's easy. That's way in the back, you know, A and Z, beginning and end of the alphabet. Jesus is the beginning and end. Back up when it says yep. all nations will mourn. Yep. Is everybody you see them coming and they're all really worried because... But what about the people that were believers? Right, yeah. So he's not talking there about the, 
the believers as Christians, we're not going to be mourning. But all of those uh, who have rejected him are going to mourn. Okay? Uh, they were the ones that are rejoicing because they are persecuting Christians. They're persecuting Christ. They're trying to stamp out uh, the Christian faith. And Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the end, he's going to be standing upon the earth uh, and he is ruling. Okay. Any questions on those on that first section? Okay. What's that? That's easy. That's easy. Exactly. All right. Verse nine, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingship and patient endurance in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. Uh, so I've got this diagram up on, on the screen here too. Ready or not, I'll return, Jesus. And I just found that I thought, you know, ready or not, here I come. You know, when your kids play hide and seek. Ready or not, I will return. You and I, whether ready or not, you know, he's coming. Uh, looking at, at verse nine that I just read, pick out three key words in that ninth verse. Explain why each word is central in the life of the Christian. Give me a key word, just any one of the words there. I'll help you out. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering. Why is suffering a key word for us as Christians? Yeah. We are suffering and we will suffer as Christians. And yet we're safe, right? And I think here in America, we've become kind of lackadaisical in our faith, haven't we? We've been relatively safe for over 200 years. It doesn't seem that way so much anymore. It's, it seems to be becoming here in America more like it is in other nations and has been throughout the history of the world, right? And think of, again, uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. You know, we can think of what's going on there for any American citizens or allies that are there for the women that are there, but also what's probably going to happen to our Christian brothers and sisters that are over there? Yeah, they're going to be persecuted mercilessly, okay? Uh, from what I understand, the Taliban, they'll probably first go for those that uh, don't agree with them as Muslims, and then they'll go after the Christians. But one way or another, they're going after the Christians. The next word, kingship. Why is that an important word? Yeah, so why is that important? Why is it important that Jesus is king? Yeah, he's going to rule over everything. It's, it's okay. Uh, so, you know, there's some things that, you know, on our church right now that uh, we'll be talking about with the next voters meeting and letting everyone out. You know, we have our furnaces go out, we have to replace, we need to uh, beginning into the parish house, replacing windows and, you know, the siding and so forth. Uh, there's issues with different, there's a hole in the, this, this is a small hole, but a small hole in the roof over at the other campus, all these kind of things that all happen uh, around the same time. And it can be frustrating. And, you know, I had to remind our councilmen who have to deal with all of these things saying, hey, you know what, whatever we do and get done, well, it's not like we're going to grow God's kingdom like it's based on us. God's going to grow his kingdom no matter what. He's the king. And I also uh, told them because, you know, those guys are really busy. Because every one of them is a husband and a father or a grandfather. And then they work a full-time job or they're enjoying retirement and so forth. And it's really hard then to find extra time to do stuff in the church. You guys all know this. You're all very involved in the church in your own lives. And I told them too. And don't worry about if things don't get done. 
because we can't screw anything up either, right? God is king. He's not going to let us screw up his kingdom. And whatever gets done to God's glory uh, is what he wants to get done. So that, that helps us have a calmness about us so we don't get so worked up. It may have taken me like 50 years to figure that out. Maybe it takes you a while too, but it's okay. Uh, and the last word, why is patient endurance so important? What are some ways that you are called to patiently endure? Okay. But what are some things that you go through? You don't have to get real personal, but what are some things that you have to... A lot of bad things that happen to you during your life for people to know. Okay. Bad. Put them off, you know, because you know us. Yeah. I got the prayer request for Sunday. It's really long. It's been the longest for a really long time. Number of people that are sick, uh, some in the hospital, uh, and dealing with cancer. Jess Holmes' sister had her first floor of her home just totally gutted by fire. Okay. Why is patient endurance so important for us as Christians? Yeah, isn't that, isn't that easy for us to do, right? Blame God instead of hey, getting, getting better. So, uh, so Paul Patterson uh, lives real close to me. You know, and he told me the other day at a cross-country meeting, he was Lara, which is his wife. He said, Lara said she saw someone that looked like you run by her house. And I said, well, that was me. He goes, you don't run. I said, I'm trying. Okay, but then I come, I come home and I run and I go in and I tell Belle, my youngest daughter said, this sport sucks. Okay, <laughs> I hate running. Biking is so much easier. I'd rather bike 50 miles and run for three miles. And yet, if you do any kind of exercise, why is patient endurance important? Whether it's swimming or walking or biking or hiking or whatever. Why is patient endurance important? Yeah, you're not going to get there unless you keep going and you work at it. So I, I told her, hey, I took 30 seconds off my time. You know, and I said, well, I may have cut some corners too, but I don't no. uh, Or the dog may have paid, pulled me a little bit, but you get, you get a little bit better, right? And, you get, and you're proud of yourself. And you, if you're hiking, oh yeah, I did five miles today on an, an easy one. Now six miles on an intermediate. Okay, whatever it is, if you're swimming and you swim just a little bit further, uh, whatever it is, and, and that's humanly speaking, and now the same thing applies to us with all of the things that we have to go through. Uh, and then John is writing from the island of Patmos. So on the screen, I've got a picture of Patmos. It's a very small island. It would be like the island of Alcatraz. What is Alcatraz known for? What's that? You can't escape. Yeah. It's an island prison, right? And that's what uh, the island of Patmos was, that the Roman Empire would dump its prisoners there. And then this is a picture then of the grotto or the cave where they believe John was when he received this vision. And so now there's a church in, in there. Can't really, uh, they've probably like three pews in the cave. It's very small. Uh, and it's very, very low to the ground. You know, the, the tour guide jokes, well, some people will say that John stood up in the cave and hit his head and he knocked out and was knocked out. And that's when he received his vision. So I stood up and I wouldn't have received a vision because I'm kind of short and it was at five, seven and I'm five, six. Okay, but that's an island, the island, the island of Patmos. All right. And then... He gets into uh, the scroll, the book that he was writing this to, to those seven churches. And then we look at a vision of Jesus. So let's go through this and uh, 
you can tell me what do each of these pictures mean? Okay, so John turns and he sees seven golden lampstands. What do the seven golden lampstands represent? Churches. The churches. How do you know that? I read it. Yeah, exactly. You read it. It says it. Okay. <laughs> Why would Jesus describe churches like lampstands? Yeah the light of the word, and then we are to be the light to the world, right? So that's what I'm trying to get at here is, as you look at these pictures and you see Jesus sitting there like this, it seems kind of a weird image, but then as you look at what do each of these visions mean, it becomes much clearer, much easier. What is, why is it important that Jesus is uh, among the lampstands? What does that represent? There you go. I, where two or three are gathered. So I, I walked by Pastor Lightning and Ethan Hutchinson, teachers at Shoreline the other day. Bell was with me and said, oh, we got four of us. We should have a worship service. <laughs> two or three are gathered. Jesus is with us, right? Jesus is with us in the room. Uh, he is blessing us. He knows what each of these congregations is up to. How about the seven stars? So who would that be? Who are the messengers of the churches? Who is your star? Yeah, woo -hoo. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it also describes the pastors as angels. So let's remember that too. Yeah, so the, the pastors are the stars of these seven churches. And what does it mean that Jesus holds them firmly in his right hand? You can see them in the image on the screen too. What is the imagery of Jesus holding the seven lamps, the, the seven stars in his hand? He has control. He has control. No one can snatch them out of my hand. For those of you that worship here, this church, does that seem familiar to you at all? Where is that? And no, it's on the stained glass window in our church, right? No one can snatch them out of my hand. And what's underneath that on the altar? Well, what is it? What do the words say? I lo, I am with you always. Yeah. No S though. Okay, lo, I'm with you always. Same thing as Jesus walking among the lampstands. I am with you always. So all this imagery is coming clear. A one like a son of man. He was clothed with a robe that reached to his feet and around his chest, he wore a gold sash. Uh, so that may point to Jesus as the high priest since the priest wore a colorful golden sash. It can also indicate his divinity and kingship as the son of man in Daniel chapter seven had a gold sash. His uh, head and his hair were white, white like wool or like snow. So was the white hair symbolize purity uh you know and white can also mean like you know wisdom right you've been around a long time uh, but also that purity his eyes were like blazing flames So what did, when you used to say that your mom had eyes in the back of her head, what did that mean? Yeah. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Blazing eyes. He sees everything. Yeah. Uh, when we were at Bethany Tangerstrom's wedding down at Circa on 7th, uh, we went off into a little area. They were taking some, some group pictures there, and they had like a little cherub up in the corner. And I told the girls while we were waiting in line, so that would be really cool if they put like blazing eyes in there that followed you when you're walking. Uh, 
And that's what Jesus is. He has those blazing eyes that sees everything. His also a part of that his eyes can see through things too, so that you're not gonna pull a fast one like that. Oh. You're gonna see right through it. I like that too. Yeah, he can see through everything too. Good. His feet were like polished bronze being refined in a furnace. What does that mean? Big, heavy feet. What's he going to do with them? Stand firm. Stand firm and also trample his enemies. Oh, uh, there's a phrase from the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Do you remember what it says Tramp about trampling? What does it say? With the grapes of wrath. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I used to see coming of coming of the Lord. So I'll, I'll quote that later on in one of the uh, one of the images, that song, but it came to my mind here of trampling. It tramples the enemy underfoot. His voice was like the roar of many waters. What does that mean? Yeah, oh, he's able to project. Uh, everyone's going to hear him. He held the seven stars in his hand. All right, what does this mean? A sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It looks really weird. It sounds like really weird uh, imagery until you realize there are two main doctrines in the Bible. What are they? Law and gospel. What is the sharp double-edged sword? Law and gospel. Okay, that's what comes out of Jesus' mouth. Uh, his face was shining as the sun shines in all of its brightness. When did we last see Jesus' face shining like this? As transfiguration, he was shining like this in all of his glory. All right, so I can, I'm kind of seeing your face. Oh, this is starting to make sense now, right? Okay. Uh, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. So again, the Alpha and the Omega, the living one. I was dead and see, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell. So John has this cumulative, uh, he has a cumulative imagery and he falls down like a dead man. And that's going to be the natural reaction of any sinner in the presence of a holy God. But the goal of the rest of Revelation is to take away this fear. What does it mean then that Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades? Yeah, he has power over eternal death. Uh, and then, well, let's go back to verses 17 and 18. Just look at each of those titles too. The first, he's always existed. The last, he will exist into eternity. The living one. He'll never die. He was dead. He died on the cross. He's alive. He rose from the dead. He is of death. Jesus has power over death. He demonstrated that with his death, uh, with his resurrection from the dead and the keys of Hades. Jesus has power over eternal death. All right. Any questions that you have on that first chapter of Revelation? Nothing. You guys are really quiet. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's let's close with prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we give you praise for who you are. Uh, that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. Help us and bless us over the the coming weeks and months as we continue in our study of revelation to see the ultimate goal of the reason that you wrote this letter to the church that was being persecuted and that is that you win help us to remember that so that we always have uh, in the midst of our suffering we focus on your kingship which gives us patient endurance all this we pray in your name amen